and I'm definitely doing this tour. Baba will do it if we have like five more people who will come. But while we are still waiting, I would like to introduce me a little bit more. I'm uh, um, where do we to start from? Maybe that I'm not originally from Krakow, uh, but I come from a town called Rzeszów on the southeast of Poland, and I came to Krakow in order to study, and I stayed. So that's a very typical scenario. Are you filming me right now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm becoming a movie star. Yes. Yes. I'm becoming a movie star. Uh, I need to put the smile number five, you know, <laughs> on my face. Um, so, I haven't. Well, I'm a guide for a long time, but this is, you know, a brand new experience. So, uh, we are going to start with a little bit longer introduction about the Jewish history in Poland and in Krakow. Um, make yourself comfortable. If someone wants to get suntanned, you know, there is a bench. If you want to look like as if you came from Krakow. Um, yeah, I'm from Rzeszów. Uh, I came to Krakow to study and I stay. I have a, I have a master degree in history of art. Um, this was what I was studying. After graduating, I became a guide in National Museum of Krakow. This is one of my jobs. Second job is a guide in the city. We are working here for the free vocative tour. It's written on the umbrella, Commercial Times. Uh, and we are the biggest and the oldest organization providing free tours in Poland. The ones who have joined some other tours of ours, they will know that we have um, tours in Krakow, it has all started here, but then we spread to Warsaw, the capital, two lovely cities on the west, so Wrocław and Poznań, one city by the sea called Gdańsk, and we have one city abroad which is called Lviv. And that makes us the biggest, the oldest and one of the best tour providers in Poland. Uh, besides this tour, Jewish tour, we have a very important tour, the Old Town of Krakow, which I will highly recommend for you to do, because this is how you can learn the basis about the city. And we run this tour three time, four times each day. By the end of the tour, I will give you flyers so that you can check the shadow. Um, moreover, we have the beer tour, for example, with this lovely guy. Um, Today, so if some after this tour someone feels like sitting down drinking lots of beer, yeah. you can sound like perfect plan, and this is what you can actually do uh, with uh, with Pavel. It will start at five from this place. If someone needs more entertainment, I would like to recommend the Macabre tour, uh, which starts at uh, 8 p.m. from the Barbican. Uh, part of the tour. Moreover, this is walking. So we are going to indeed cover the whole distance on foot. We start in Kazimierz, we will walk mainly in this district, then after some time we will cross the river and we will finish the tour in Podgórze, the second district um, of Kraków, second district on our way. And this is free, meaning that you don't need to book, you don't need to sign, uh, you don't need to pay anything adv in advance to take part in the store, but at the very end, you are more than welcome to leave us that you are actually grateful for this tour. So you can, for example, kiss us or hug us to show that you really appreciate it, that we are lovely. I am we some kind of hug you back. <laughs> we adore it, really. That's very nice. But also, if someone feels awkward about kissing or hugging some sort of alien person, you can simply lend us money. Give us money uh, because we are 100% tip based. Our company is an NGO. We don't get any support from government or nothing. So if you want us to grow larger, have more city in Western Europe, so took part in crusade. Everyone who was a participant said that only Christian people can live in their country. So this is why Jews had to leave. France, Spain, and uh, countries all around. And for example, this is why they came to Poland. Poland greeted them with uh, arms wide open because Jews were very well educated. They could read, they could write, they could count, something that we savages didn't have any idea how to make uh, back then. So they were very important for us because of their knowledge. We gave them lands, they gave us knowledge, that was fine. And back then in Krakow, Jews, the first Jews, they settled on the area of the university district. The ones who have been on the old town, you have been to Collegium Mites, the place with the beautiful courtyard. This was the first Jewish district in Krakow. 
But right now we are in Kazimierz, and Kazimierz was a city, a separate city to Kraków, created by the king, Kazimierz the Great. This is the king from the 50s Złoty Banknote. No? And this city was created at the beginning of 14th century, and ever since there was also a small Jewish community here. This community grew larger in Kazimierz at the beginning of 15th century where, where, when were massive pogroms in Prague. So the Jews were coming from Prague here settling and those Jews, they have built the old synagogue. Right now you don't see too much, we will take a step so you will take a, take a picture and you saw it actually where we were just sitting there. But they built the old synagogue and it actually is right now the oldest preserved synagogue in Kraków. So this is the moment when you can just turn and say, wow. Is it so still in use? It's, it's the oldest. Is it in use? No. The Jewish community uses it? Yeah, and no. I will tell it in a second. I will tell it. It's not a synagogue. It's not a working synagogue. It's not in use. Sorry. Um, so this is the oldest synagogue ever. And this Jewish community, which is here from 15th century, it grows by the end of 15th century because the Jews from the city of Kraków are forced to move here into Kazimierz. Uh, there was a huge fire in the city, in the area of Jewish district, and there was some sort of stupid rumor that simply the Jews put the fire on, and also the fire destroyed the uh, church called St. Anna Street, which is very close to this uh, university district. That's why they were forced to come here, but they never said that they are Jews from Kazimierz. They always said that they are the Jews from Kraków. And we can say that this 15th century is actually the very strong beginning of this vibrant, uh, vibrant community which will live here for more than five centuries, which will uh, enrich this place so much with their traditions and uh, way of, uh, of living. And this rich, vibrant community will be destroyed in less than five years of World War II. But I'm going to focus on this, on the second part of the tour. Right now I'm going to tell you as much as I can about the Jews living here before the war. So we know that they are here, the synagogue is here, and in 16th century there is, a, there is actually a fire in the synagogue, so an Italian architect arrives here. This name of an architect is Matteo Gucci, and you probably all know Gucci's who are making extremely um, expensive purses and perfumes, it's the Gucci. So the Gucci actually renewed the synagogue and also in 16th century this funny part and the front was added and it is called in Polish Babiniec because a lady in a nasty way it's called Baba in Polish and Babiniec is simply a part for women to pray. In Orthodox Jewish culture the women had to be separated from men and my friends are explaining this in a way that if there were some very beautiful lady next to men who are praying how would they concentrate? So this is why we have this separate part. And also at the same time in 16th century, there was a few administration offices added to the building of the synagogue. So from then, this building becomes the religious and administration center of the Jews in Kazimierz. It lasts until the World War II. Uh, and during the war, this synagogue is preserved because it works as a warehouse. So nobody was destroying the walls, they are all original, like we are standing here right now. And only the roof was blown up. Uh, the reconstruction of the synagogue was done in the 50s, so during uh, the communism era. And ever since, this synagogue is a museum devoted to cultivate Jewish culture and Jewish traditions. Uh, this museum will be closed in a second because on Mondays it's closed very uh, soon. But if someone stays here for tomorrow, you can come back and uh, see inside. It's not a very modern museum, so not like you touch and there's something light go on and you know, confetti. It's not this type, it's rather uh, very traditional, but you will learn really lots of things. You will see the very precious Torahs, um, the, the items to pray, all of this is set. So right now, the oldest synagogue turned into a museum. Any questions? This street, where we still are and we will still visit some places on the street, it's called Sharoka. And anyone has an idea what does it mean in English? What? Exactly, you, uh, uh, you are getting a bit, you're not Polish, you're not Polish, that's important, no, no, you're Dutch, there you go, how did you know that? Dziękuję bardzo. 
Miss Big Bowlers? Yes. <laughs> That's a trader. Uh, okay, but enjoy the pain anyway. <laughs> so, uh, it means wide. And we can say, in other words, wide is broad. So we are simply on Krakow Broadway. Mmm, again, something cool. But this street wasn't ever known for the theaters. There are no theaters here. This was the main market square of the Jewish district, of the Jewish part of the city. So where we have scars right now, there would be lots of stands, people would be selling things. And all around this place, all around Sharoka, we have few synagogues. We've seen the oldest one. Next to it, uh, there used to be another synagogue associated with the Kabbalist Nathan Spira. And here on my left, your right, there's another synagogue. Some of you see just three, but there is a synagogue indeed. Uh, and this is a synagogue called Wolf Popper Synagogue. Wolf Popper was a really rich person. He was one of the financialists in the 17th century in uh, Krakow. And he had a few sons who were studying in order to become rabbis. And he had also one daughter. A girl in a typical Orthodox Jewish family needs to become a mom of dozens of Jewish babies. But Wolf Popper's daughter had one tiny thing that wouldn't help her to do this future because she was extremely ugly. So the loving da daddy who wanted to help his daughter, he decided to build the synagogue, decorate it very beautifully, and he said that everyone who is going to marry his daughter will be the owner of the synagogue, and the name of the synagogue will change from Wolf Popper Synagogue into some other person's synagogue. It didn't change. But the synagogue is still <laughs> called Wolf Popper Synagogue. No, so it didn't help his lovely daughter. <laughs> Maybe, for her, exactly, maybe she would have more luck if she was born a few centuries later and she knew a lady which was born in the next house. When you will, I prefer to keep you in the shade right now, but next door you will see there is a greenhouse. And in this greenhouse, a lady called Haya Rubinstein or Rubinstein was born and we know her more as Helen Rubinstein. She was also a member of a very orthodox Jewish family in 19th century. She was born around 1870, something like this. And she didn't like the idea to become a mom with dozens of kids. So she decided to emigrate from Krakow, first to Vienna, then to Australia. We have few Australians today. So Helena went to Australia, and when she was working under the hard sun of Australia, her skin became so beautifully, stayed so beautifully pale and fresh. And all the ladies were asking, yeah, and all the ladies were asking like, Helena, Helena, how do you do it? You know, like Rachel and her friends. And so she said, oh, you know, my grandma gave me this uh, little jar of cream. I just put it on my face before I go to the sun and it protects me. And I know the recipe and can make it for you. So she started to follow the homemade recipe to make cosmetics and sell it. Further on, she started to make new cosmetics and her company moved to Europe, then to States. And before the crisis in States, she managed to sell her business for $8 million. And after the crisis, she has bought it back just for two. That's called business. We should all learn from Helena. And also, we should learn one more thing from Helena, because she was the one who actually made women think about their looks, make, about, make them think about their makeup very much. And she also designed the idea of beauty salon. So a place where a lady goes, spends half of her salary, and becomes Venus. Uh, we all like that very much from time to time. And Helena said that there are no ugly women. So such case like Volt Popper daughter doesn't exist. Because there are just the lazy women. So this is how she explained it. I believe that we can also learn it from Helena. Any questions here? No. So we are going to leave this place, take a look at the greenhouse on the, a little bit uh, further then, because we are moving to uh, another synagogue which is uh, linked with one of the most famous Jews who lived in Krakow. Yes, this is the greenhouse. Maybe I will close them. 
synagogue which is called and we can see the sign on the arch it's in Hebrew but it says that it is a new synagogue in the blessed memory of Rabbi Rema new synagogue because this was the second synagogue built after that one uh, one century later so 16th century and Rabbi Rema was originally called Moses Israelis and he wrote a very important book for the Jews but before I will go to this I need to say that this was going to be obvious for most of you but Judaism as religion is based on two books the first one is called Torah and it consists of five books which are also the beginning of the Old Testament for the Catholics so this is obvious as you can see that you are nodding and the second book is called Talmud which are mostly the commentaries for the Torah and I believe that some of you have seen the page of Talmud some no and if you have seen this a page of Talmud it's not like just text in rows but this is a little bit of text in the middle which is the oldest commentary to the Torah then below it we have a text which is commentary to that commentary then next to it we have commentary to the commentary to the commentary and it continues like this with commentaries to the commentaries of the commentaries of the commentaries for the whole page just like a snail house highly difficult for anyone who is not a scholar to get what's the sense of it of it all so in 16th century two rabbis had the same idea to write those commentaries in an easy language which will be accessible not only for scholars but for everyday uh, use of a pious Jew and one of these uh, rabbis was called Joseph Caro he was born in Spain so this is why we called him the Sephardic Jew I told you already he wrote a book with the, those easy commentaries and he has called them the set table. Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch, exactly. When he has... Yeah, you got the pen, yeah? <laughs> Good. There you go. Good, I'm collecting them now. <laughs> you have three more designs to collect because I have three designs. So this is the maximum uh, positive answers you can go with. Uh, so exactly. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, the set table. Then he has sent the book to Rabbi Moses Israelis, who was here the best scholar in Krakow. And Moses Israelis got pretty depressed when he saw this book because he understood that Joseph Caro has written the same book that Moses Israelis was already writing. But then after a second, he thought about it and he said, okay, it's fine because Joseph Caro has written the book for the people who live in Spain. And climate in Poland is completely different, although today, doesn't seem like it uh, and this book is needed for the Ashkenazi Jew and the Ashkenazi Jew are Jews who lived in the Central Europe simply Poland uh, um, Germany because Ashkenaz is Germany Russia Czechs uh, Hungary it's all Ashkenazi Jew and Moses Israelis decided to name his book the uh, tablecloth so Hamapa <coughs> if I know correctly the tablecloth makes the set with the set table and this is how those two books are crucial for the religious Jews all over the world right now they are printed together and one of them was made here by Rabbi Rema um, behind the synagogue of Rabbi Rema there is the oldest Jewish cemetery with the tombstone of Rabbi Rema and this is a tombstone that was untouched by the Nazis during World War II. Most of the tombstones were completely destroyed and then, um, yeah, there were horrifying uh, things were going on. Um, but there was a legend saying that the tombstone of Rabbi Rema is cursed. So no one dared to touch it. And because of superstition, really, it got saved and you can still see this. So again, um, the, the Rema Synagogue is a place where you can come back after the tour. Let's move on to the shade. Exactly. This, I'm not giving you a pin, it's too easy for you. <laughs> it's as if I ask you your name, I guess. And you want to hear into this? So, the remaining, we have a hole here, not everyone can see that, so I guess uh, it's better that you move. We have a hole here in uh, the entrance, and this is actually the hole that stays here because there used to be a mezuzah here. What is mezuzah? 
Mezuzah is normally a little box uh, with a scroll of a prayer called Shema Israel, Listen Israel, it's one of the most important prayers. And this scroll is put inside a little box, which needs to be put on the right side, yeah, it's on the right, of the entrance to a house. And a pious Jew touches a mezuzah every time he enters and every time he leaves the house. It's some sort of a protection, uh, I would say, to the household. Uh, on mezuzah you have either a little window, either a letter, Shin, which stands for Shaddai, it's one of the names of the God. So this is how, uh, how it looks like. And in Kazimierz, on our way, when we will visit the houses, if you will pay attention, you will see loads of those empty holes like here. We will see very few mezuzahs, which are still were like still used by, by the Jews. Mostly we will see those empty uh, pieces or a piece of clay which was put it here in order to cover it. But for me, it's a very symbolical, very actually beautiful way how to show that someone, something, someone was here and it's gone and it cannot be replaced in any other way. Let's go. And here by the entrance you will see the real Mezusa on the right. Finally, the whole room. Uh, please sit down. There are places here. Some places here is the full, uh, the full bench. Uh, free to sit down. It's the nicest moment on the tour on this uh, hot day. So really enjoy it. Make yourself comfortable. And we are right now. Perfect. We are right now in the synagogue called the Isaacs Synagogue. And there is a true story how this synagogue was built and the legend. I will start with the legend because it's way funnier. <laughs> uh, so, it was believed that there was a man called Isaac, Isaac Yakubowicz was his name, and he was a very poor guy in character. He was an Orthodox Jew, so he had thousands of babies, uh, but he didn't have money to support his family. So he was praying very hard, for God to help him get some sort of means to protect his family. And in one dream, Isaac Yakubowicz saw a very beautiful city with a beautiful bridge full of sculptures. Bridge full of sculptures, beautiful city. Prague. Prague. Exactly. You are winning. Uh, there you go. And he saw. And he saw that under the bridge there is a huge treasure. The next day, Isaac Yakubovich woke up and he thought, yeah, okay, I got some dream, but who believes in dreams? Just forget about it. But this dream came back and came back every single night, and Isaac Yakubovich couldn't stop thinking about it. So finally, he told his wife, look, honey, I'm going to Prague. There is a, there is a huge treasure. It would help us exist. So, bye. Uh, the wife was very caring, so she just nodded, and she let him go. And Isaac Yakubovich really walked to Prague. It was in 17th century, so he marched the whole way. And when he was already in Prague, he saw, of course, the beautiful bridge, the Charles Bridge, but he saw that this is surrounded by the soldiers. Somehow he managed to sneak below the bridge, and when he started digging, the soldiers took him up and said, that, hello, the bridge is right now out of order, you cannot do nothing here, and you can dig here below the bridge. And Isaac Yakubovich decided to say the truth, so he said, yes, you know, but I have this dream that there is a treasure below this bridge, so I want to dig it up to help my family. And then the soldiers started to laugh so much that they couldn't stop. And when they finally stopped, one of them said, oh, this stupid man, if I would believe in dreams, I would be already in Kazimierz, because in my dream, there is a huge treasure in a stove of a house of some guy who is called Isaac. But first of all, how am I going to go to Kazimierz? I don't like walking. Second of all, how, I, how am I going to find Isaac when every second guy is called Isaac in Kazimierz? So that was it, but Isaac Yakubowicz immediately understood to which Isaac does the story refer. He said, bye again. And he marched all the way back to home. He destroyed the stove. Of course, his wife went furious about it. But then it turned out that there was really this huge treasure in the stone. So it's a brilliant legend, everyone can interpret it their own way. I really like this story. And this is how Isaac 
had this money to build the synagogue. But the reality is way more trivial. Isaac was simply a rich guy uh, who had loads of money, uh, who was again a financialist, who was a good friend of our king, but this was the fourth. And Isaac Yakubovich simply got the permission and got the means to build the synagogue. Till now, when we were walking, you've seen that all synagogues, all synagogues were pretty small. This one is the largest. Yeah, it looks, uh, it is very high. And this is because normally synagogues couldn't be higher than the highest church nearby. Here, the, the priest of the local church, he said, okay, and this is how the synagogue managed to be done. So built, it was built in the mid 16th, uh, mid 17th century. And it was actually built by two great uh, artists, an architect called Giovanni Prevano, and this is one of the guys who rebuilt Babel into Baroque style. And also, have you been on Grodzka Street? It's the street that links Babel with Main Market Square, and in the middle there is a church with, uh, with, with a fence of figures. St. Paul. St. Uh, Peter and Paul, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no choice, just uh, just shoes. Okay. okay, there you go. Uh, exactly. And uh, the same, and Giovanni Trevano also has done this church. So this synagogue and those decorations uh, were made by Giovanni Battista Falcone, also another Italian uh, sculptor. Some of them are restored, and you can read here on the plaques what does the prayer refer to. Um, and also, uh, this part on the top, any ideas what's that for? Yeah. It's for the females. Oh, this was correct. The women sit the there. Women. Exactly. This is for the women. Yeah, there you go. Um, half of the group was going to have the pit, no <laughs> worry. Um, so exactly, that used to be uh, for women. And right now, this is still the working synagogue. So uh, we are very lucky because in the morning there were prayers here. But uh, right now we can just uh, learn a little bit more about the Orthodox Jewish religion and learn that this part is the most important part of the synagogue. It's called Aron HaKodesh. And this is a place where Torah is stored. Um, Torah, the real Torah in uh, the Judaism, it's not a book, it's a huge scroll. It's probably can be this size, for example, no problem. And nobody is allowed to touch Torah because Torah is as valuable as human beings. So Torah has very decorative dresses, lots of crowns, lots of decoration on it, and you cannot touch Torah with your bare hands, actually. Uh, when Torah is inside Aron HaKodesh, this, in this place there should be a light. This light is called Mertami, which means eternal light. And every time it's on, that means the Torah is inside the Aron HaKodesh. And this place behind you, just a little like little balcony inside the church, it's called Dima. And this is here in order to read Torah. So every Shabbat, Monday and Thursday, or every huge holiday, Torah is taken from Aron HaKodesh, brought to Bima, and one of the men is reading it out loud. A man in Orthodox Jewish religion case already a boy who is 13 and who has had his bar mitzvah, which is the sort of an event when he reads Torah out loud in the synagogue for the first time. When he is a genius, he also says some little commentary, or just uh, if not, he just reads it out loud. And this means that he has become an adult, he becomes a member of the community who is praying, and he also can become a father. Uh, so 13, I would wait at least for 16 or 17 maybe, but this is, um, this is how it goes. And here, right now, this synagogue is, as I told you, the used synagogue. It belongs to an organization called Chabad Lubavitch, and Chabad Lubavitch are Hasidic Jews. Hasidic Jews, um, this Hasidic movement was established, created on the lands of Western Ukraine in 18th century. In 17th and 18th century, on the lands of Poland and Ukraine, we had terrible wars. Uh, the Jews were uh, persecuted here. The synagogues were being destroyed. So it was very difficult, for example, the whole community to gather and to pray um, because there weren't the, the synagogues were destroyed, as I told you. So this was one thing that Jews needed to find some other way in order to pray. Second thing, in 18th century, lots of Jews claimed themselves as the Messiah. 18th century, 
because you people said that, hello, I'm the Messiah, I will um, restore the world, but it didn't work this way. So lots of people were very disappointed with the Orthodox religion. And one man in Western Ukraine called Israel Ben Eliezer, he had the idea that you don't need a rabbi to pray, you don't need a synagogue to pray, you can have your own inner connection with the God. And oh, you don't need to... Baal Shem Tov, exactly. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, he had this idea that you can have your inner connection with the God, you don't need the synagogue, you don't need the rabbi for this. You can simply enjoy your life, sing and dance and cherish the God in every single thing you do. This is what God wants you. He doesn't want you to be miserable. He doesn't want you to cry, to hide. He wants you to rejoice and to enjoy your life. Also, you don't need to know Torah by heart. It's important, of course, it's the basis. But rather, this, this, uh, this inner connection, it's way more important. So they mix a little bit religion and traditions with the Kabbalah. So the Jewish, uh, do that Jewish um, um, mysticism. Uh, and of course, this movement became very powerful and very strong back then. Lots of people were tempted by this idea of being a Jew, so different from the Orthodox. As you can, as you can imagine, the Orthodox hated the Hasidics because how you cannot read Torah, how you cannot read Talmud, this is the religion, not some sort of singing, dancing, and you know, la la la. So this is, uh, this is how it goes. And those two uh, sides, they really loathed each other. Later on, on our next stop, we will learn what was their common enemy that made them like each other. Um, but this is how the Hasidic movement was established. Right now, the biggest groups of Hasids are in the United States, and they are very closed communities, so it's difficult to get inside, and it's also very difficult to go outside if someone doesn't want to live that way. This is, um, uh, this is how it goes. If you need some time to take pictures, one, two minutes, uh, and a German, back to Jerusalem to stay there, say. So this is why they decided that it's no point waiting for the temple to be rebuilt, restored, because in this symbolical way, they can have the temple wherever they are in the world. This is why they call it this way. And also this is why, because of this assimilation process, that the number of Jews increased so much in Kraków and, and before the World War II, the city had 64,000 Jewish people, uh, which was one-fourth of the population of the whole city. This story ends here, and right now we move back to the second building. I will change my position. You stay, you stay where you are. I will just change my position so that you can hear me a little bit better. And this building. This building is called the Jewish Community Center. And it's a little, it's not a long story here to tell. But I need to say that thanks to this uh, assimilation, you know that we have 64, thank you. Uh, we had 64,000 people after the Holocaust. From three to five thousand survived, and these people tried to live in Krakow as normal as they could. However, after the World War II, you know that we had we were liberated by the loving brothers from the Red Army. We had jolly communist era. And uh, by then, in March 1964, the general, um, uh, the headmaster of the party, Władysław Gomułka, said that Jews are not welcome in Poland. Why he said that? Why he said that so shortly after the Holocaust, who took place, which took place here? And we can just have some hypothesis because he didn't even explain it well. So probably, first of all, Gomułka hated intellectuals. This is official, and Jews were mostly intellectuals. Second thing, the USA uh, supported Israel, and Russia didn't get on well with USA back then. Second reason. Third reason, Polish politicians had a huge problem with Polish society, which didn't accept the change of borders which we had after World War II. Because you probably know before World War II, Poland had many lands on the current east, not so many lands on the west, and it has changed 
completely. So people were still like not fond of this at all. They were dreaming about getting Lviv back, getting Vilno back, but that city didn't seem to work. <coughs> so probably the politicians needed to find a new problem to get the people <coughs> stop thinking about one thing and to put their attention in another thing. All in all, what is true, we will be never 100% sure, but the Jews needed to leave Poland again, and from those three up to 5,000 which stayed after World War II, we had 200 in Kraków. Very small number. The situation started to change after the fall of Iron Curtain, 1989, um, when the Jews started to reunite again people who had Jewish heritage. They stopped fearing so much about it. They were coming back to their roots. And 10 years ago, a very famous man came here and uh, very famous, very rich. I will tell you in a minute who was that, actually. If someone knows, don't spoil the history, okay? <laughs> uh, so this very famous man, he came here and when he met with the local Jewish community, he was so touched with their histories and their testimonies that he said, name one thing you want me to do and I will do it for you. So they were thinking for a while and they decided to ask for a center, a place where they can meet because they had some synagogues in Krakow, but synagogues are mostly for religious people, not everyone was religious back then. So a place where they can simply, I don't know, sit down, drink a coffee together, talk together, have their own spot in Krakow. And this is how he gave money in order to settle this thing, which we call Jewish Community Center. And this is exactly the place where right now Jews can gather in order to have some meetings, have some special workshops, um, they, they, they spend time together, they have some sort of lectures here. Also, it's open for uh, non-Jewish people in order to come and learn more about the Jewish culture. Um, and also, this is a place where a Pole who thinks that they might be Jewish can come and check their roots, the history of their family. They will help you here to check if grandma was real name was Polanski or if she just made it up after the war. This is all that after. So, oh, it takes us uh, quite a time. So, one more stop in Kazimierz and we will be slowly Correct. Passing. It refers mostly to the uh, rules to connect it with food, uh, but also kosher can refer to all other, um, all other um, things in your life which you, which you follow. This is just like a list of rules in order to follow. And right now, this building, it's not longer used as the, uh, the kosher uh, butcher shop, uh, but it's simply a place where you can buy zapikanka. And zapikanka is, you just take a look, everyone is getting this long baguette. Uh, so zapikanka is half of a baguette uh, covered with some sort of mushrooms, cheese, and all other sorts of things you want to put. And zapikanka was created in communism at times as a sort of Polish pizza. This is how it should uh, work. Zapikanka, some of you have eaten this. Yeah, I've been told. Uh, so the impressions, rather positive or negative? Positive. positive. Okay, so that's uh, that's quite important. And uh, Zapikanka, right now there are some queues. If you will come back here in the evening, this place will be just full with people buying this. But the biggest queues are around midnight when everyone has had already three beers. And this is when Zapikanka tastes best. Um, and then you go to continue uh, with the party. So right now, this is again another very vibrant, very vivid place in the Jewish district. And how did it happen that we have so much life actually here? The communists, uh, which I were just talking about a few seconds ago, they, uh, they have found this district as a completely empty space because more majority of the houses were simply left by the people who died during World War II. And the communists had a great, great idea how to use this space. They decided to put here all the people with problems. So for example, people who have just left jail or some sort of families with alcoholism and other pathological problems. And for 60s, 70s and up to 80s, this was a completely non-go place. My best friend's mother who used to be a student back then in Krakow and she said that for a whole